to reflect on things that impact our character. And I do ask at this time uh, for your presence with me, especially to make clear everything that we'll be talking about. Because we know that these are realities that we have to deal with in life. And may you give us attentiveness, give the listeners a good internet network, and also myself, that everything that needs to be done will be done and we'll be able to hear your voice speak. We also pray for those who are on the road, like the dean, uh, that you'll give them safety of trouble. And so thank you for this evening in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, so friends, today I chose to speak about a life of self-discipline. It should be quite obvious why that topic is very important, uh, but I do hope that as we talk about it, you will see why it is that critical. Now, the passage that I, that I put there as a kind of reference is Galatians 5, 22, 23. And for those familiar with that, you can check it out if you're not. It has to do with the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth and ends with self-control, which is another word for self-discipline. And so when we talk about self-discipline, really that's what we are dealing with. Now, let me begin first of all by reflecting on uh, the creation that God made. Uh, it's interesting that when you look at all creatures of God, uh, they tend to live by instinct and they're helpless to do so. And I give a few examples there. I do not need to spend too much time on them. But when you have an animal that is hungry, it will clamor for food. If you have ever seen lions fighting over meat after killing the animal, it's like each of them is just trying to tear and eat. And uh, there is absolutely no control except to feed itself. Or if, if animals are on heat, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the dogs in particular, that when they're on heat, they just, they're so restless until their passions are met. And it's the same thing. The other day I was watching the tigers and uh, a tiger, tigers are lone animals, but at the same time, when the female is on heat, it, it scratches, it uh, susus, it does all sorts of things to attract the male. Uh, or when you talk about anger, when they are angry, they cannot mute their fury. And those that hibernate mostly in the Northern Hemisphere or in the colder climates, they do so powerlessly. Now, there is a difference. I think a major difference that these animals, these creatures live by instinct, but human beings were given to live by choice. And so when we are talking about self-discipline, we are talking about choice, choice. We have the ability to tame whatever appetites or passions or desires that may be going on within us. And I think, you know, in my thinking, this is actually part of God's image. Now, God's image, as we know, of course, uh, for me, having studied theology, I can tell you, uh, it has been corrupted by sin, but has not been obliterated. It's still there and still very important. And one of the things in which, which we share with God is that ability to tame our appetites and passions. If you think about it, God is angered by sin, but he does not all of a sudden come down and say, okay, I'm angry about your sin and I'm going to... No, because he has self-discipline. And it's the same thing that he has shared with us, that we too may have self-discipline. Even when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, it is an act of self-discipline. When he could take himself there and he says, yes, although I have the power to escape it, I'm going to give myself to it. That's an act of self-discipline. Now, we need to take note that when we fail as human beings, it does not actually mean that we do not have the ability to restrain ourselves. So we do have the ability for self-discipline. And this comes particularly from two sides. One, that's how we were created. But secondly, 
from those verses that I made reference to, it's also by the spirit of God. We do have self-discipline. Now, so this whole subject of instinct versus choice is I think an important one for us to understand that human beings were not created like animals, that they would just you know, flow with whatever emotions, whatever tempers, whatever experience they have. But unfortunately, as we talk today, there is a lot of talk of that's what I want. And everything has come down to my preference. Everyone has come to what I really prefer and want to do. And so we do not want to deny ourselves. We do not want to stop doing what we need to do. And so the, the contemporary world has turned what was vices into virtues. Or those things that are uh, our weakness, that weaken us, we've turned them into areas of our strength. But this is what I would call aping the creatures of instinct. And that undermines the very image of God that he made in us. Now, I do know that some uh, most religions do have a sense of discipline. Hinduism, for example, extols discipline, the discipline of asceticism and a number of those things that I mentioned there. But that's not the kind of self-discipline that I'll be talking about today. I want to talk about something that's different. Yes, self-discipline has to do with conquering yourself. For example, you're angry and you feel, I must do something. Um, you know, what do I do with that anger? Now, when we talk about human beings, or when we, are talk, we talk about self-discipline here, we are talking about the ability to balance anger and how you react. What is your response? Uh, that gentleman there, Paulo, he said, if you conquer yourself, then you can conquer the world. And friends, that's a very important statement, which has been repeated by many, even Socrates said exactly the same thing. And some of those Greek philosophers, they said exactly the same thing. The point is that if we have no self-discipline, it becomes difficult for us to even do anything about disciplining any of the other people. Even if you are in a position of a CEO, you are a supervisor, uh, whatever you are, if you cannot rein in your own tempers, your own passions, your own appetites, it becomes difficult for you to be able to manage anything. So let me say something now about self, the kind of self-discipline we are talking about that we need. And I'm talking about a self-discipline that touches on every aspect of our life. And you can see what I'm pointing out there, whether it is sex or food or money or pleasure or emotions and so on. All those are things that fall under self-discipline. In fact, self-discipline is something that we take, we use all the time, everywhere, without even recognizing that we are. For example, this morning when you woke up, or when you know when you wake up, what are you using? You're actually using self-discipline. If uh, if you're a child, of course, it is someone else who will wake you up. But when you're an adult, you wake up because you have you you yourself are disciplined about it, and you know there are certain things that you need to be doing. Now, the self-discipline that we are talking about, which may also be called self-control, is defined to be the ability by the dictionary to behave calmly and sensibly even when you feel excited or angry. In other words, even when those passions are there, are you able to act calmly? Are you able to rein in those emotions and act sensibly? That's the kind of self-discipline we are talking about. Is the restraint in the face of attraction, in the face of passions, when you're provoked and someone says something that truly angers you, I can remember times in my own life when I've sat in a meeting and I'm being insulted. How do you respond to that kind of thing? It takes self-discipline. Now, self-discipline is not something that happens when there, is, there are no emotions, there is no provocation, there is nothing. No, we are talking about self-discipline. Self-discipline is actually best portrayed when you are attacked, when you yourself are facing difficulties. So this self-discipline that we need 
is calling us to sit in the driver's seat of your life. You see, when you lack discipline for yourself, what happens is you're handing over your discipline, you're handing over authority over your life to another person. And we are saying, no, you should sit in the driver's seat of your life, manage it, and be able to push forward. It, and it does not matter what situations may be there. Yes, you are going to, you are going to meet uh, physical and emotional obstacles, opposing factors, distractions, hard work, or even unfavorable odds, people who will hurt you. But you now should learn to live with the people who don't like you. And by the way, you need to keep in mind, nobody owes you love. They are the ones who know that they are indebted to you for love, but don't expect other people, even if it is your parents. Many of us struggle with that. You need to learn that your life, what the decisions you make and how you respond to situations should not depend on how other people are treating you. Self-discipline has to do with choosing healthy habits and managing resources like time and energy effectively, avoiding the lure of immediate gratification, because that's the big thing today, immediate gratification, so that you may gain success and, and so forth. Self-discipline also gives direction and impacts positively on mental health and your overall well, well-being, because what self-discipline does is to reduce on your own stress and your own tension. Because you have calmed yourself, someone angers you and you have self-talk where you say to yourself, I am not going to be angry. Maybe you're hungry and you're looking at food and they say, buffet, what are you going to do? You say, I'm going to take it calmly. That is the kind of self-discipline we are talking about. It reduces stress, it reduces tension, and in the end makes you more healthy. In other words, with a self-discipline, you choose between what you want now and what you want ultimately. It has to do with the character. It is growing your own character. So this self-discipline is the ability, the power to be able to say no to my appetites and passions and so forth, and to be able to say yes to Jesus' will. In other words, your values should determine your behavior your values, you know, left yourself without any values. Your behavior just runs amok. And as Stephen uh, Covey, who talked a lot about leadership, he's, he wrote and he said, the ability, it's the ability to subordinate an impulse to a value. The ability to subordinate an, an impulse to a value. In other words, you must be a person of value. This self-discipline, when you lack self-discipline, it makes you vulnerable. The Bible itself tells us. In Proverbs 25, verse 16 and 28, listen to what it says. If you have found honey, eat only enough for you. Now, many of us don't know what is enough. You just want to eat because it's nice, it's sweet. And honey here is used as a figure. It can be anything else. You have found honey. How much will you eat? Lest you have your fill of it and vomit it. And in verse 28, it says a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. And then in Proverbs 16, verse 32, we are told that whoever is slow to anger, now it is talking about anger, again, and self-discipline. That person who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. So friends, we need self-discipline. And this self-discipline is the ability to cultivate contentment with what you need, even what you have, not what you want. Look at that quotation on the right. It says, to be content does not mean you don't desire more. It means you are thankful for what you have and patient for what is to come. You know, you're content. It's very important to be contented. If you're not contented, you will never be disciplined. It's one of the most important things in your walk, in your life. Now, if we can turn a little bit to the passage that I, uh, I, I put up there. Self-discipline is a measure of your spirituality, by the way. 
It's a measure of your spirituality. You know, in those verses, we are told that self-control is a constituent part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, a constituent part. In other words, when you walk by the Spirit, you fruit with self-control, you fruit with self-discipline. Fruit is characteristic of the mother tree. We know that very well. We usually know uh, the fruit by the tree. If you look at an orange, you, you know that you'll get an orange from that. Or if you look at the orange fruit, you know it must have come from a tree called an orange tree. So the tree and the fruit kind of define each other. And that's what we are talking about here. That if you walk by the spirit, then your fruit should be like that. In other words, your character should be like the character that the Holy Spirit forms within you. Self-discipline is if, if you are led by God's spirit. And similarly, if you, have, if you are a good person, if you are a good plant, if you have got good fruit within you, then you yield the good fruit. But if you are a diseased plant, if you are coming from a diseased plant, then you produce also bad fruit. These are words that are spoken in the scripture. I don't need to spend much time on them. But what I'm saying is that it's a measure of your spirituality, self-discipline. And this fruit cannot be disaggregated. In the Bible, in those verses, it is talked about as one fruit. It does not say fruits. The Holy Spirit is like the plant, and he's one. And then you have love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of those are part of it. And I've given you a little illustration of an orange on the right there. Just to show you that when you hold an orange fruit, it has those different parts. Now, don't worry about what they are called, the names we never use about the orange. But the orange has all those. It has the seed, it has albedo, flavedo, it has a central core, and so on and so forth. And so it's the same thing, even with this fruit. It cannot be disaggregated. Self-discipline is cultivated from within, just like this is cultivated from within. Now, the daily cultivation of self-discipline is very important. And I call this gardening your life of fruit. And we need as human beings to be able to garden our life, to garden our character until we are able to fruit with the right thing. Friends, your character is not going to be formed by default is not going to be formed by accident. Your character depends on a lot else. And I'm going to mention about four or five things here. The first thing, self-discipline must first of all determine to work toward a goal. You see that little girl on the right? She knows where she's going. She has a goal. And you can see with a bag, uh, a backpack on her back. And that means that she's going to school. It does not matter whether she's barefooted or whatever. She knows where she's going. And so self-discipline begins with a purpose. And the question that I would ask you, what is the purpose of your life? What do you intend to be? Maybe in the next five years, maybe in the next 10 years, what do you intend to be? Many of us pass through life without any purpose. Now, if you don't know where you are going, you are essentially going going nowhere. If you're just loitering, you are not actually going to any place. In that, in that case, then you are going absolutely nowhere. You need to know your goal. What is your goal? And this is a question that I want to leave in your mind. Secondly, walk in unbroken personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus himself made a statement, John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, and listen to what he said. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he says, I am the vine. In other words, he is the plant. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. When you have that unbroken relationship with him, then you are able to bear fruit. And he says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. What Jesus is actually saying here very simply is that when you are cut off from union with him, 
your character is likely to go out of control. And so if you want self-discipline, the first one of the things that you need to do is to have that unbroken personal relationship with Jesus. And for those, for those of us who have given our life to Christ, that actually means I believe his word, I trust his word, I obey his voice. Like the hymn says, trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. So walk in unbroken personal relationship with Jesus. Thirdly, choose what is right. Self-discipline calls upon you to choose what is right. Now, the other things are desirable. Nobody is questioning that. Indeed, some of them look like a very reasonable opportunity. But the question is, are they the right thing for you now? Now, that takes self-discipline. For you to be able to say, I will choose what is right over and above what is desirable or what is merely a reasonable opportunity. In this life, you're going to be attracted to choose between pleasure between, you know, to choose between leisure and a controlled temperament. So what are you going to choose? These things are very attractive. They are very desirable. There is no question about it. You can see that quotation by Bernard Shaw, I never resist temptation. Things that are bad for me do not tempt me. And I think I've quoted it for you before. Simply because those things are desirable does not mean that they are right for you to take or Job himself who made a choice. And he said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? Now for many of us, the men, especially the young men out there, may I say to you, can you make a covenant with your eyes so that they don't loiter around at one person after another, looking at them? You know, make a covenant with your eyes. Jesus said, yes, those desirable things are sure to come. Those things that attract our eyes, those things that attract our passions, our appetites, they are going to come, that's for sure. You cannot stop them. But you need to make a covenant with yourself. Now, one of the most important things that I have found in my own life is to make a prior determination, a prior commitment of your course of action. Christians quite often are very naive about this. And they, pres they presume, I've walked with Christ for a long time, therefore I can overcome whatever situation comes. Or sometimes I hear many Christians say, let's pray that sexual desire goes away. Let's pray that greed goes away. Let's pray. Why don't you make a determination, a commitment that I am not going to do this. Let prayer be for God to give you the strength to keep your commitment. Let us not use wishful thinking to think that that is self-discipline. And you know, self-discipline only happens when you are in the act, when you are before, before the act. In other words, when you determine ahead of time prayer to the activity, prayer to the action, Take, for example, if you have a girlfriend or boyfriend, can you decide how are we going to relate with one another? It's a very simple thing. You make that decision ahead of time. So when you meet, then you know how to relate with one another so that you can keep the purity that you need to have in your relationship. So I'm calling upon you to resolve in your heart for righteousness. Now, you're going to be exposed to a lot of things, whether it's public resources, or it can be a pure relationship with your boy or girlfriend, or speaking the truth. Sometimes when you're caught off guard, what are you going to do? Choose now to say, I am committed, I am going, I'm resolved, I'm going to be speaking the truth. Okay, so that is a choice that you do need to make. And of course, you need to understand that you grow your strength, your grit in self-discipline amidst the overwhelming noise within to give in. You know, everything is going to call upon you to give in. Why should you have this discipline? Why should you stop the appetites and the passions that you feel? But you know, friends, every temptation will be your opportunity to do good. Self-discipline, just like you see this man here, he's got to work hard and grow and garden until at some point there is fruit. 
in his garden. The fifth that I want to mention here, deny self-indulgence a foothold in your life. Deny self-indulgence. Self-indulgence is where you just give in. And many of us have probably been brought up in homes where, especially the, if, if, you, if your parents were able to give you everything you need, when you ask for something, they give it to you. You ask for that, they give it to you. And so you have been softened by that and you think that you can get whatever you want. Deny self-indulgence. You need to understand you cannot have everything in this life. And the moment your parents move out of the way, you are no longer able to get the things that they were giving you. And how do you do this? First of all, the fear of God. Proverbs 8.13 says the fear of God is hatred of evil. The fear of God is hatred of evil. It's the same thing even love. The love of God will keep you from that because those are the things that compel you to flee the presence of evil. If I were to take my example with my wife, if I love my wife as I do, and of course I can say also fear her, not in a bad way, but fear her, then I've got to live in a manner that pleases her. I'll live carefully. And that's the same thing even with God. That when you fear God, it does not matter who sees. It may be in secret. It may be in public. Wherever you are, you live a life that hates evil. Secondly, to deny self-indulgence will take you to watch what you feed your brain, what you put in your head. Your character is formed from within you from within you. So what you put inside you is exactly what will be coming out. And I want to commend to you, feed on God's word, keep godly company, be prayerful, read and listen to what edifies and builds you up. That's what will change you. In other words, what you put inside, and we used to say years ago, garbage in, garbage out. And so don't put garbage within you. Develop good habits. Habits are formed by repetition and consistency. When you do the same thing again and again consistently, it eventually becomes your habit. Even simple things like reading your Bible on a daily basis. That's how it becomes your habit. And the day you don't do it, you kind of miss it. And you just, oh, I must do it. So develop good habits. That's a very important way for you to move forward. Self-indulgence will be denied if you refuse exposure to what attracts your weaknesses. I remember reading a, a, book, a little book, fictional book many years ago of a man uh, in this book who had come out of uh, being an alcoholic life. Now, the thing that he was advised to do is never to walk toward a bar or to walk past a bar, because the moment he's walking past a bar, he will smell the alcohol and he will be attracted. So refuse that kind of exposure. And this exposure comes in many, many different ways. Look at that. It comes through pornography. It comes through blue movies. A friend of mine, and I might have talked about him uh, in an earlier talk, a friend of mine many years ago, who went to watch a blue movie and then he went back a second time and the next thing he found himself sleeping with a woman 15 years his age just to let out the excitement the appetite that had been generated by the blue movie what about the bad company some of the company that we keep is just not right now it takes self-discipline to say i'm not going to be with them or well, social media today oh my goodness social media some people just can't let go of their phones. People cannot let go of, you know, in, in a day, just think for yourself, how many hours are you spending on social media? What about junk food? We are, we are learning to eat very badly, particularly in Africa. It never used to be so. We we'll eat good food. But many of the young people, if there is chips, oh, they are most happy. What you don't realize is that's junk food. So KFC comes. Now I'm not saying you can't eat it once in a while, but if you're eating it every time, listen, you are eating junk food. You do need to know that it helps you to refuse exposure to those things. 
Yes, they smell very good and they attract you, but don't. I no longer eat that, uh, you know, chips, for example. Flee if it is necessary. Sometimes you may need to flee or remove yourself from its presence. It's Martin Luther, the reformer, who gave counsel. And he said, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. So the birds will fly. Things are going to happen all around you. But why do you allow them to nest in your hair? Fourthly, discipline your body. Discipline your body. Physical exercise is not for nothing. It has been found that actually physical, consistent physical exercise promotes other healthy habits as well. Things like time management and, of course, even minimizing procrastination. Just, you know, we, we usually think physical exercise is just for the body. No, it actually builds up discipline in many other areas of your life. But may I also say, be accountable to someone, especially if you realize that you have a weakness. It's very important for you to be accountable to someone near you whose life and values you respect. That becomes very important for you. Let me just end by reflecting on Joseph. And I know I have talked about him before, but he illustrates this very well. Because Joseph, in that story in Genesis 39, we are told about how Potiphar's wife wanted to rape him, to rape him. She said, come and lie with me, come and lie with me. And you know, the first, the, there are four things that I want to point out about Joseph. First of all, Joseph had cultivated trust in his master's house. He knew what was his, he knew what was his. And so he was a trusted person. If you cultivate trust, that's part of your self-discipline. It's very important for you to be a self-disciplined person if you are to be trusted. Secondly, Joseph set himself boundaries and limits. For example, he knew very well that Potiphar's wife was not his wife. Potiphar's wife was Potiphar's wife, period. And therefore, when this woman, it does not matter how good she looked, as far as he was concerned, he had already determined in his mind, this is Potiphar's wife. And those are the limits that I'm talking about, the boundaries. So you need to know what is yours and what is not yours. You need to know what's enough for you. You know, I could give you a story about eating avocados in 1968, but let me skip that. And it was me, actually, uh, because I had completely failed uh, I was a young man, um, very young, uh, although I was in school. Uh, and then I decided to eat avocados because I was extremely hungry and I had no other food to eat. And you know what? What the Bible says that you end up vomiting it, that's exactly what happened. When you So learn to have what's enough for you. Thirdly, Joseph lived a life of self-control. He was alone with Potiphar's wife. Think of it. He was alone with Potiphar's wife. No one would have known, so we think. But even alone with, his, with Potiphar's wife, he had the same values that he would have when Potiphar himself was around. He did not change that. He lived a life, his entire lifestyle was a life of self-discipline. And so Potiphar's wife is the one actually who had no self-discipline. And the moment Joseph escaped from her hand and she, was, she, she kept, you know, she pulled off his garment, she started publishing her own indiscretions to her servants. And as soon as the husband came back, again, she did exactly the same thing. Now, those are the people who are, whose life has no self-discipline. And so unlike Joseph, She's what I was talking about earlier, a verse that I read for you earlier. She was like a city broken into without any walls. Friends, live a life of self-control. Let that self-discipline be your lifestyle. That you are able to choose what to eat and what not to eat, what to do and what not to do. That's how character is formed. But fourthly, Joseph restrained his desires. I want to believe that Joseph being a young man, and he was quite a young man at that particular time, 
he had sexual desire. He really did, just like any man. And the young man boiling over. But Joseph restrained himself from that opportunity when it presented itself. Why? Because he had limits. He restrained his desires. Here is someone who had the discipline on himself. He knew that, yes, he may, be, he may have sexual desire, but he was not go, uh, going to go ahead with it, even when an opportunity presented itself. So, friends, that is the kind of self-discipline that I want to commend to you. I'll end with a few quotations. One, the first one is from President Harry Truman, uh, former president of the U.S. And he said, in reading the lives of great men, I found that the first victory they won was over themselves. Self-discipline with all of them came first. Came first. And with that, by the way, Socrates agrees. And he says, let him that would move the world first move himself. In other words, if you cannot move yourself, if you cannot discipline yourself, you're not going to be able even to move others. Aristotle, he said, I count him braver who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies. For the hardest victory is over self. In other words, self-discipline is the hardest victory, but it is all worth it. That's what Aristotle is saying. And then he also says, what it lies in our power to do, it lies in our power not to do. In other words, no excuses. If you have the power for fornication, you also have the power not to fornicate. If you have the power to be greedy, you also have the power not to be greedy. If you have the power to be angry, you also have the power. That's what Aristotle is saying. You have the power to remain tempered so that you don't blow off your lead. Friends, let us be people of self-discipline. Archimedes, uh, the Greek philosopher, actually a kind of engineer. Uh, and we know him very well from mathematics. For those of us who have studied mathematics, he said, give me a place to stand and I can move the world. That's when, uh, you know, uh, this is, it's not actually very sure if he actually said it, but that's what he said that he did. That give me a place to stand and I can move the world. Can we find a place where we can move our own character? so that that character becomes God-like. Thank you very much, and may the Lord be with you. As long as God keeps waking you up, he's not done with you yet. Thank you very much. God bless you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Canon Dr. Jen Sinyoni. Uh, just when you were winding up, my son asked me, Mommy, uh, do you think I'm self-disciplined? <laughs> So I'm really amazed because he's usually around me when we am having these sessions, but he's usually doing his own things. What amazes me is actually able to pick uh, what is being talked about. So he says, Mami, am I self-disciplined? I would like to hear what you think about me. So I think this has been a beautiful session. Personally, I also pick out lessons to, you know, help my family grow uh, as a mom, as a parent, as a wife. I'm also learning a number of things. And now today, We've been learning about uh, self-discipline. Thank you so much, Reverend. And just allow me to also pick out a few comments from the uh, from the chat. Uh, people are saying thank you for the session. Truly, Doctor, one time someone annoyed me, but I told my heart not to react. For sure, I didn't. Um, even the next day, I was normal. Like I didn't lose anything. Oh, beautiful. Blessed to you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much for the session. Uh, somebody said, amazing session. Thanks, doctor. This one says, fear women. <laughs> okay, somebody says, oh my God. Uh, how can men resist nodes? Okay, amazing story of Joseph. Uh, this was a good topic. Oh, oh, wise to share with my family member from, okay, yeah, perfect, sure. I feel my colleague uh, was here. So some people are wishing that other people were here. No, we are happy that you've also attended so you can go and share. And now, like we said, we have this recorded on YouTube so you can still share the link and then they'll be able to watch. Okay, so some have exchanged their bodies for KFC. 
Uh, sometimes we want to manage things, but time management is our biggest challenge. Uh, doctor, may God give me the grace to overcome. But where do people get from money to eat KFC every day? Uh, okay, where do they get the money? Okay, friend, only right. Uh, okay, let me see. I saw a question somewhere. I don't know if I'll be able to pick it. Uh, okay, temptations are not evil and they are common to man and God will always put a way of escape. How do I tag? Okay, somebody says, how do I tag my, how do I tag our manager at work? <laughs> she needs this topic so much. Okay, okay, interesting. How can self-discipline versus chasing for opportunities in life, like money, chasing be overcame. As far as I have known, where money has been involved, discipline has never been a consideration. I hope that as um, Reverend continued with the uh, session, you were able to find the answer to this uh, question. Or maybe Reverend, just maybe a quick uh, comment on this question. Uh, that's about money. Yes, yeah, so it says, how can self-discipline versus chasing for opportunities in life like money, chasing mm. be overcome? As far mm. as I've known, where money has been involved, discipline has never been a consideration. Okay. Now, let me make a distinction. There is making money. There is pursuing money like it is life. Those two things are different. And when we talk about self-discipline, we are not saying you should not work to earn or that you should not even work to make wealth. That's not what we are saying here. You can make wealth, okay? You can make wealth. Uh, like it has been said many times before that, uh, you know, be the master of your money, but don't allow the money to become your master. When you have money, you need to learn that is, it's not what makes you who you are. Let me just use my personal example. I was vice chancellor of a university. And I do remember very well uh, the, when I had just been appointed vice chancellor, all of a sudden I was presented with a check. In those days we were using checks and I had to sign off a hundred million shillings, something that I had never done in my life. Of course, Subsequently, I was even signing off one billion. But like Joseph, and that's why I like the story of Joseph, I knew what was my money, and I knew what money was for the university. The money that was mine was that which I was paid, either in terms of remuneration or in terms of per diem. And what the, all this came because from the very beginning, I was committed to make a distinction between what is mine and what is not mine. Many of us have, you know, we think that when we get there, we'll, de we'll decide. May I ask you, please, learn that, uh, learn that there is money that you're going to work for that will be yours, and there is money that will not be yours. But finally, let me also say that when you have money, once you have made wealth, understand that it's not for you to give yourself or to, uh, to expend on yourself so much. You know, and that's what I was saying, you are eating KFC, someone I think wrote there, eating KFC on a daily basis or going to the expensive restaurants. Yes, occasionally give yourself a treat, why not? Give yourself a treat. But don't think that all of a sudden extravagance befits you simply because you've made a lot of wealth. Understand that money is a trust. It's God's trust. And when God gives you money, that means he also wants you to help others that are in need. When I was working at the university, I had a little amount of money that was going to student tuition. It's not because I was being paid a lot of money. No, I was not being, if I were to tell you that story, it was not because of that. But remember that it is a trust, it's a stewardship. Actually, I kind of debated whether I should talk about stewardship today, but it's a kind of stewardship. And with stewardship, 
comes responsibility to use it for the good of many. You use for yourself, for your family. Yes, I want to make sure my family is not suffering, but I also have to be mindful that there are other needs. I have to give money in church and so on and so forth. So I think in the short time, that's what I would say. Maybe we can address the issue of money at a later time, but for now, let me just say that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Reverend, for that response. And I've seen somebody says the spirit is always willing, but the flesh is always weak. Uh, not always weak. We have learned on how to deal with these things now. So we should endeavor to be determined, like Reverend has said. Okay, maybe just one last comment. Yes, thanks, Reverend. There are many issues, but all is integrity and being God fearing is displayed in your discipline. And this is a key for self uh, conquer, as stated by Alice. Okay, thank you so much for all those uh, wonderful contributions.